Hello, I'm Christian. Most of you watch my YouTube videos know me already. This is my friend Jeremy and my friend John. How's it going, everybody? And we're doing a movie review in case you can't tell from the title of this video. And the movie we want to review is the 1931 horror classic Frankenstein. Now, Frankenstein was produced and distributed by Universal. And the film is directed by James Whale, who would go on to direct movies like The Invisible Man and the sequel to this movie, The Bride of Frankenstein, among many others. And the movie is loosely based on the 1818 novel Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus by Mary Shelley. And when I say loosely based, I mean anybody who's actually read the book and seen this movie would know that the movie basically just takes the same basic idea of the book and throws the rest of it out the window. Now, I have read the book, and later on in this review, I'll address some of the major differences between this movie and the book. Now, of course, movies did not exist back when the book was first published, but between this movie and the book, there have been many different play adaptations of the book, and this movie actually takes more inspiration from some of the Frankenstein plays than it does the original novel. This is also not the first film adaptation of Shelley's story. The first film adaptation came out in 1910 and was actually produced by Thomas Edison's company. Now, a lot of people think that Thomas Edison actually directed that movie, but that's actually not true. There was also another adaptation called Life Without Soul in 1915, and there was another adaptation in 1921 called The Monster of Frankenstein. Now, even though this was not the first film adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel, this is by far the most famous adaptation of the story. Now, Universal actually made this film as sort of a follow-up to their adaptation of Bram Stoker's Dracula, which came out earlier the same year. In fact, they originally wanted Bela Lugosi to play the Frankenstein monster. John, you know a little something about this, right? Yes, I do. One of the reasons why Lugosi turned out because he didn't like the idea of being covered in makeup because it would have covered his pretty face. And also, he didn't like the idea that a talking, a non-talking monster would be as scary as they thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. You think his face is pretty? <laughs> no, that's okay. He, he was a very sexy man. He was a sex symbol at the time. I mean, I'm pretty sure the theory about him, you know, turning down the role because, you know, he, from what I've heard, he thought, oh, you know, it's all so much makeup and I don't even have any lines. Yeah. That's... He thought it was beneath him. Didn't you hear, yes. didn't you tell me something that kind of contradicts the uh, yes. theory that he turned it down? And, I, and I'm not 100% sure how true this is, but I did read that he might have been fired along with the original, the original director, who I believe his name was Robert Carlyle, something like that. But again, that's, I'm not saying that as definitive. Kind of makes you wonder if, like, if, uh, if Lugosi played the monster, would we not, would we not have Boris Karloff or not? It makes well, you... You know, his, uh... His look for the monster was reported to be very different from Karloff's. It was someone I remember compared it to the silent movie monster called the Gollum. Yes, yes. I've heard you that know. before. I read that recently. Yeah. It's like, I think he once said that he created his own monster. You know, because yes. Karloff went on to become a big success while the studio relegated him to parts that really were kind of beneath him. They didn't give him the parts he deserved yeah. because he was a great actor. And it's ironic that he would actually go on to play the Frankenstein monster in one of the sequels, which we'll talk about when we review that one. If you think about it, when you watch uh, Dracula and Frankenstein back-to-back, -back, they literally have almost the same actors except for Lugosi. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Now, when was the first time you guys saw 1931's Frankenstein, and what did you think the first time you saw it? Jeremy, you could oh, go first. Yeah, that's. I first saw this when I was about six years old. I mean, I first got into the Frankenstein monster after I, my family and I saw this guy dressed up as the monster at this outside this little this spook house thing in Lake George, and that's how I got into it. You know, we would go in. It was a walkthrough ride. And you'd see all these, you know, models of these monsters. You'd press a button, and through the this little glass window, you'd see them move. And with him, he was lying. The model of him was lying on this lab table, and you'd press the button, and there'd be all this electricity, and the monster would just, you know, rise up. And it was great. And I was hooked from then on. And I actually, and I saw the movie, you know, Frankenstein, and. You know, I was hooked. I mean, he was always my favorite Universal Studios monster, but that's when I saw it, and then I became hooked on all the other classic monsters as well, and then that led to my interest in other kinds of horror, and I've been in love with it all ever since. All right, John, when was the first time you saw this movie? Before, like, like 
getting to ho the Halloween films as a kid. I Universal like one of my first love of horror because as a kid watching like Michael, Freddy, Jason, and Chucky that scared me. But watching Universal Monsters didn't scare me as much because they weren't as like blood or gore and uh, but they were still fun to watch. You see, it's like wow, this is like history of like this is where like early like horror like stuff and like where it all started, how it like, became such a huge success and. I think the first time I may have saw, maybe I may have been like seven or eight years old, but I, I can't remember like which one I saw first. It's, it just became a thing. Because my dad like introduced me to these films as a kid, and it just became a, a habit to watch every Halloween, and I marathon them every year. And since then, I've been a fan of horror fit since. Honestly, I don't remember when I first saw this movie, but I think I was eight. It was on AMC, uh, AMC's Monster Fest. I don't know if you guys remember that because they changed it now to. Fear Fest, but I've, I've heard of that. About. Yeah, but way back, AMC used to not even have commercials and stuff, and it used to legitimately be a movie channel. And every October, they would do Monster Fest, and that's when I first saw this movie. And I was like eight at the time, and uh, I know I saw Bride of Frankenstein first, but I did see this movie eventually, and yeah, I loved it as a little kid. But I think I've definitely appreciated it more as I've gotten older. Same with me. Also, I, oh, yeah. I, Abbott Costello was like the first one I saw. Then that's how I got hooked and started. Now, the plot of Frankenstein is it's about a young scientist named Henry Frankenstein who becomes obsessed with the concept of life and what creates life, and he essentially wants to be like God and create life himself. So, with the help of a hunched back assistant named Fritz, the two of them start robbing graves, and Frankenstein actually makes a man-made body made from the remains of different dead bodies, and unbeknownst to him, he puts the brain of a criminal inside the body of this creature that he created because Fritz accidentally got the brain of a criminal from a science lab. And in the presence of his old teacher, his fiance, and his best friend, Frankenstein brings this creature to life using electricity. Now, what Frankenstein's old teacher believes that this creature is an abomination, and he tries to destroy it, but the monster ends up killing him and escaping from Frankenstein's lab. Eventually, the creature accidentally kills a little girl, and the girl's father ends up rounding up a mob to go after the creature, and Frankenstein realizes that the creation of this creature was a mistake, and he ends up helping the mob try to destroy the monster. Now, in the film, Colin Clive plays Henry Frankenstein. In the book, he was called Victor, but we'll discuss that more when we discuss the differences between this movie and the novel. In the movie, Dwight Fry plays Frankenstein's hunchback assistant, Fritz. Now, Fry previously played Renfield in Universal's Dracula. Now, Fritz was sort of an early precursor to the character of Igor, who would appear in some of the later sequels and later adaptations of Frankenstein. Edward Van Sloan plays Dr. Waldman, Frankenstein's old teacher. Now, Van Sloan also played Van Helsing in Dracula. May Clark plays Frankenstein's fiance Elizabeth. And of course, Boris Karloff plays Frankenstein's monster, and he is just so iconic in this role. Now, even though Karloff has been in so many other films since this, this is by far his most memorable performance, I think. So what do you guys think of some of the acting and the characters in this movie? Oh, it's fantastic. It's top-notch, you know, especially Boris Karloff, who... You know, he's able to emote so much with uh, by and say, even while saying so little. You know, he's just incredible. He evokes our sympathy. He makes us feel, you know, what he's going through, basically being this being that's been created through these unorthodox means. And because of that, he just doesn't fit into this world he's been forcefully brought into. Yeah, you feel so much sympathy for him because he's an innocent creature. He didn't. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what he's doing. Exactly. Like, and you understand why the villagers are going after him because the little girl did die. Yeah. And that's the main reason they're going after him. But still, it's like, it's like he's put in this really horrible situation. Yeah. Like he didn't know what he was doing, and that's what makes it so tragic. Yeah, I agree. What do you think of the Frankenstein monster in this movie? Oh, it's it's it's, it's great. It just shows that you don't need, like, a, a monster like him does not need dialogue to be scared just by his facial expressions and also how, like, he's misunderstood that. Like you said, he doesn't know, like, doesn't know any better because he's a monster that's created. He doesn't blame with society. He doesn't know, like, understand a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did you think of Colin Clive as Frankenstein? Oh, uh, he's terrific, too. I think he deserves uh, a lot of credit, you know. He just, he's so good at playing this character who's just been consumed by this obsession yeah. to... And he, 
Uh, to not to uh, oh. cut you off or anything, oh. but he's oh. really good at, like, uh, he's a mad scientist, but he's still sympathetic at the oh, same time. Oh, sure, yeah. You can see, even at the beginning of the movie, kind of what, I guess, the stress and all the arduous long hours of building this creature have done to him. They've taken a toll on him. He probably hasn't slept in a while. He probably doesn't eat too much because he's so consumed by his work. And he, Colin Clive, portrays that perfectly. And uh, I think another... I think a reason why he portrays someone with an obsession so good is so well is because he had his own tragic obsession with alcohol. He oh, did. Yeah. He actually yeah. died very young, too. Only he 37. did. Yeah. Yeah, he was another actor who just died too young. Because I think had he lived, he could have given us so many more great performances. Who knows? Maybe he could have had more roles in the Universal Monsters film with different characters. Who really knows? Possibly. Yeah. And what you what you think of Frankenstein in the movie? It's, as in the creator. It's it's great. Oh my god, it's phenomenal. I love it. It's like wow. Like he goes from first he like starts out playing a mad like an obsessed scientist who wants to bring a creature back, thinking that he's God. And also later on he realizes that my my creation was a mistake. I'm gonna help these villagers stop the monster. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. I love it. It's like, wow. And what do you think of Dwight Fry as Fritz? Oh, he does a great job, He does job a great job. Too. Even though it's a, it's a little bit smaller than he did as Renfield, but still, it's, it's very good. But I found Fritz to be a bit of a jerk sometimes. Oh, he's an oh. asshole. Oh, yeah. Fritz yeah. is a piece of I mean, shit. I, I, mean, get, I get it. He's afraid of the monster. But seriously, leave the monster alone. Well, That's... It's just he helped Frankenstein create the monster, so why does he have such a problem with it all of a sudden? <laughs> oh, but probably because the, the normal brain. The, yeah, the abnormal brain. Yeah, I mean, well... Fritz didn't really know what at, that it wasn't. Well, yeah, that's normal. true, yeah. He couldn't read, remember? That's true, you're right, I yeah. Just, I just, I love the way Dwight Fry just walks his Fritz, you know, with a little cane and he's hunched over. He's I loved like when he's going to answer the door, he, like, fixes his sock at one point. Yeah, yeah I also like how he just complains, oh, I've got too much to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think Fry, like, he was an underrated actor, because yeah. unfortunately because of Dracula, he got typecast in a lot of stuff, but... Honestly, the character he plays here is so much different than Renfield and Dracula, I would say. Yeah, yeah I would say uh, Fritz is a jerk, but he's clearly not insane like Renfield. No. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Because he, he doesn't ki doesn't kill at all in the movie. He just... Uh, well, he just tortures. Yeah. What do, you, what do you think of Edward Van Sloan as Frankenstein's old teacher? He does a good job, too, and I also like that they have him at the beginning, before the movie even starts, you know, introducing mm -hmm. this story to the audience and, you know, warning them it could <laughs> shock you. It may even horrify you. <laughs> you know, I just love that. Me too. I remember meeting, uh, well, one of the members of my family, uh, who unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, she was alive when this movie came out, and she knew I was into horror, and she said, you know what the scariest movie was when I was a little girl? Frankenstein. I, I, that's like any generation. Everyone has like a different opinion about what they thought was the scariest one when they were a kid. And yeah. Some say it was Frankenstein in that generation, or... Uh, Let's see, like in the 60s, Psycho, or Night of the Living Dead, or Rosemary's Baby, or well, the 70s. Well, you know, we have to also keep in mind that people who were living at that time weren't exposed to more, you know, extreme horror no, like we are. So no. this was enough to terrify and them, plus this, this, this it's more tame. You wanted to talk about Frankenstein's father in the movie, yes. Baron Frankenstein. Yeah, I think he's a complete and total snob. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I agree. There's, oh God, there's that one scene at, uh, it's like at, they're preparing for Frankenstein's wedding, and he's drinking this, you know, wine that's, you know, been, I guess, aged to perfection. <laughs> and he tells the butler, you know, uh, give the servant some champagne. This stuff's too good for him. <laughs> and then the camera pans over, and the servants are right there. And I love when he... In the beginning, when he doesn't know what his son is doing, he thinks his son's with another woman. Yeah. Ah, it's another woman! <laughs> yeah, he's a... How does he know it's not another man? I find the fact that he was willing to basically say, yes, this wine is too good for you, and I'm going to hog it all while they're in the room to just be such so douchey. I don't know if what you guys felt, but I always thought there was something going on behind Henry Frankenstein's back between uh, Victor and Elizabeth. I agree on that. I think it's more so like, uh, you could tell there was feelings for each other, but I personally think there was still a respect, though, that yeah. Victor knew, this is not my woman, this is not, you know, so I, I don't think there was anything like, I don't think they were outright, you know, sleeping with each other. No. If anything, I feel like it was more an arranged marriage that Elizabeth didn't really want to be in, but she sort of accepted. Uh, yeah, because there's a part later on in the movie, you know, after the monster scares Elizabeth in her bridal room or whatever it's called, and Henry, before he goes after it, says to Victor, you know, you must watch over Elizabeth, you know, I leave you in her care, whatever happens. Um, and I always kind of read into that as, you know, if I die, you know, 
be with her. Here's a fact about that uh, that part when she when she's locked up in the room. In the, the scene when the monster comes out and scares her, May Clark was so afraid of uh, Boris Karloff's makeup because it was so realistic that she was afraid of him. And he said to her that when you see me wiggle my finger, it means I'm acting. I'm not being serious. <laughs> That's sweet. <actually>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Carl, Carl, Carl was actually a really nice guy off set. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Elizabeth. Um... Yeah, I think she's a good character, too. She, you know, she's worried about Henry, and, you know... She loves him. Of course, and I think she respects that he's a scientist devoted to his work, but she's also worried about his health. Yeah, uh, and I think that, that, that could be everybody in, in a relationship. Yeah. And I also just want to mention with Victor, um, I mean, this is a minor thing, but uh, I just can't help... You know, when they're talking early in the movie about what Henry is possibly doing, they don't know for sure yet. And Dr. Waldman says, you know, something about, you know, reanimating the dead, or that he needs body parts, and he just goes... Oh, well, what are the lives of a few rabbits and dogs? And I'm like, dude. What are some more of your thoughts on the film overall? Like, do you think the film holds up well oh, after sure. all these years? Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it's one of a bunch, many horror masterpieces. You know, there's a lot of, I like the atmosphere, dark, gloomy, you know, almost gothic. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like a lot of the music, and also in the other uh, ones in the series, too, which we'll get to. Uh, you know, I just like this kind of foreboding sense of dread, also. And one thing I want to see, I want to mention is, you know, towards the end of the movie when Henry Frankenstein confronts his creation after everything's happened, and you know, there's a close-up on their faces as they look at each other, and the monster, you know, gives him what I read as a very condemning look, like, "Look at what you've done to me." Right. Yeah. I love that part. I will say my only issue with the film is I feel like uh, there's a lot of unnecessary humor in the film. And also, that little prologue, I mean epilogue at the end of the film, after the monster quote-unquote dies, where you see Henry Frankenstein still alive after being thrown off the windmill and stuff, I thought that was so unnecessary. I mean, it's, like, it's like, given what the themes of the book were, Frankenstein kind of needed to die in order to, like, sort of address what the themes are that when man tries to play God, right. you F yourself pretty well, much. Universal, I guess, wanted a happier ending because they didn't want it to be all gloom and doom, especially after the characters are put through so much. And I and I, I think the film holds up in, in, in a way because of the, like you said, the atmosphere and also the the performance of uh, Carla with no dialogue. It's just, it's, it's phenomenal. It's fantastic. I love Colin Clive's performance. And uh, um, as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate it for what it was that time period. Yeah, and I just, I think it it has a theme of, you know, humanity just doing or trying to do what Try they God. shouldn't. Well, not even just playing God. You know, there are some things, I mean, like playing God, but there are other things, too, that we are just not meant to do. And when we do, it leads to disaster. And I think that's a theme that can be, that's universal. You know? Now we're going to talk about some of the major differences between this movie and the book. But before I do that... Have you guys read the book? Oh, yes, I have. Ah, what do you think of the book? Oh, I really love it. It's, uh, it's a great novel. It's a fantastic read. Um, you know, and I also like how, you know, the monster does, is more articulate in it. Yeah, what do you think of the book, John? I did like it, but it was, it, I read it about a year ago. I just don't remember, like, some parts of it, because, you know, when you read something once, it's hard to, you have to read, like, read, read again to refresh your memory. You see, I'm one of those people where I, when I read something, I typically can remember it even years after I've read it. I admire it. that. Yeah, but I've read the book twice, actually, and the book is actually one of my top 15 favorite books of all time. Because it is a horror novel, but I also look at it as being more of like a philosophical drama about the dangers of man playing God. Now, one major difference between this movie and the book is, in the book, the main character's name was Victor Frankenstein, but in the movie, they changed it to Henry. Now, what's interesting is, in the movie, there's the character of Victor, who seems to be loosely based on the character of Henry Clairvell from the novel, who is Frankenstein's best friend in the book. It's sort of like they changed the character's names around, I guess. Now, in the book, Frankenstein Einstein does not have an assistant. In the movie, he had the assistant Fritz, but that was a character that actually originated in one of the Frankenstein plays and was then added in this movie, but he was not in the book. Frankenstein worked alone in the book, and I feel like that actually works better and is actually kind of creepier because you get this whole idea that the monster was essentially, and the creation of the monster was Frankenstein's dirty little secret. This was something that he 
he did on his own and kept a secret from everybody else. You could almost look at, like, the monster, the creatures being, like, the illegitimate child of Frankenstein, like the, like, the child that the father didn't want. And I do sort of feel like the fact that Frankenstein brings the monster to life in the presence of his friends in this movie kind of misses the point of the book in some regard. Also, in the book, it never actually tells you how Frankenstein brought this creature to life. All the stuff about Frankenstein bringing the creature to life using electricity, that was added for this movie. Now, in the movie, the monster is pretty much misunderstood throughout the whole film. However, in the book, the monster starts out as sympathetic, but actually becomes very intelligent, where he teaches himself how to read, and he becomes just as intelligent, if not more intelligent, than than Frankenstein himself, but the more intelligent he becomes, the less sympathetic he becomes because he starts committing evil acts on purpose just to spite Frankenstein. Now, the movie does touch on some of the themes about how man should not try to play God, but I feel like those themes are much more prevalent in the book because in the book, Frankenstein essentially gets his wish. He becomes like God is. He creates an atom, which is what Frank the monster basically represents in the book, but Frankenstein neglects the fact that God has an enemy, Satan, and that's essentially what the monster becomes to him. The monster starts out as Frankenstein's Adam, but becomes the Satan to Frankenstein's God, essentially. Now, the book also had a lot of parallels with the 17th century poem Paradise Lost by John Milton, which was actually one of the books that the monster taught himself how to read in the novel, and the poem Paradise Lost was a retelling of the biblical story of Adam and Eve, but it was all told from the point of view of Satan, and that poem is famous because it doesn't portray Satan as a villain, but more so as kind of a tragic hero. And once again, Mary Shelley essentially wrote the book Frankenstein as sort of her parallel with Paradise Lost. So, while I do like the movie, you could kind of tell that they basically just took the basic idea of the book and threw the rest of the book out the window, essentially. Now, this movie was a huge success when it came out, and it, of course, spawned a series of sequels. The first sequel was 1935's The Bride of Frankenstein. Then in 1939, you had Son of Frankenstein. Then in 1942, you had The Ghost of Frankenstein. Then you had Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman in 1943, which was also a sequel to The Wolfman. Then you had House of Frankenstein, which was a crossover between Universal's Frankenstein series, their Dracula series, and the Wolfman series. Then you had House of Dracula, which once again was a crossover between all three of those series. And then the final film of Universal's Frankenstein series was 1948's Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, which was both a parody and sort of a sequel to the Universal Monster films. Now, we'll of course be doing standalone reviews on each of the sequels, but what do you guys think of the Frankenstein sequels overall before we start talking about them? Oh, well, uh, they're, you know, Bride and Son are both very good. Bride, of course, being another masterpiece. And the Son, I guess, to an extent is as well. Um, you know, but then after that it just went all downhill. Okay. So, I agree. Bride and Son, they're the, be the best of sequels when you watch them back to back, a perfect trilogy. And Ghost of Frankenstein, downhill. I mean, I, I like House of Frankenstein, and Frankenstein meets the wolf. I mean, that's a great, I mean, that's a great one. That's awesome. Like, seeing the two uh, horror icons fight each other is awesome. Well, I mean, some of the, the sequels, you know, they have a few things going for yeah. them, but ultimately they just don't measure up well to the first and three. How's the Dragon, even though it's... Dracula, even though Frankenstein's in it, but that was really like, it's like, you guys ran out of ideas. You really were, like, <laughs> you struck out. Now I want to talk about the cultural impact that this movie had, like, on pop culture and on later adaptations of Frankenstein. For example, even though in the book, the monster... Mary Shelley never actually described what the creature looked like. In the movie, this that image of, like, the monster with the bolts in his neck and the surgical scars and the flat top, that's the image that most people think of when they think Frankenstein. And, of course, in pop culture, a lot of people think that 
the Frankenstein monster is Frankenstein, even though Frankenstein's the name of the creator. But in a way, that's kind of apt, because in the book, you kind of got this idea that the monster was becoming a mirror image of Frankenstein. So in a way, it's kind of appropriate that people in pop culture kind of mistake the monster for being Frankenstein himself. Yeah. I can see the confusion. Even I, I was confused. I never realized that until, like, like recently. I never would have known that... The monster's not Frankenstein, it's a creature. There is no name for the monster. That was like a recent thing I learned. I mean, it's just the image of the monster fits so well with the name that it's like, it's yeah. iconic, you know? Would you say that Mary Shelley didn't describe the monster? Maybe that could have been the horror aspect. It could have been like anything. Like Yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. And also, a lot of the later adaptations of Frankenstein that had nothing to do with these movies still definitely took inspiration from this movie more so than the book. As I pointed out before, in the book, Shelley never describes how Frankenstein brought the creature to life. So all the stuff about like bringing the creature to life using electricity, that's stuff that basically every other adaptation of the book has touched upon. And even the iconic line, it's alive, has been used so many times over, like, even in Kenneth Branagh's adaptation of Frankenstein, the one where Robert De Niro plays the monster. Yeah. I never he, saw that one. My dad said it was terrible. It's not very good, but... So I've been told. He says it's alive when he brings the creature to life, which was obviously taken from this movie and not from the book. Um, and then, of course, you had the Hammer Frankenstein films, which personally are my favorite Frankenstein films. Uh, I think Peter Cushing is just so great as Dr. Frankenstein in those movies. He's such a bastard in those films. I also want to point out the Mel Brooks comedy, Young Frankenstein, which was a spoof on the Universal Monster films. Uh, what do you guys think of Young Frankenstein? Oh, uh, I love that I movie. Love it. It's one of my favorite it's comedies. Hilarious. It is. It's one of my all-time favorite I've, comedies. I've seen it so many times, I can quote from start to finish. You must be Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. Well, they told me it was Igor, but they were wrong then, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. Oh. What 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 hump? Oh, never mind. I actually I saw the Broadway musical that was based on it. Really? How was yeah, it? It was wonderful. <laughs> Loved it. I also want to point out the movie The Monster Squad, which was definitely Fred Deckard's tribute to the Universal films, and that was actually the movie that kind of introduced me to the whole idea of Frankenstein because I saw that movie before I saw any of the Universal films, and I just remember uh, I just remember Tom Noonan's performance as the Frankenstein monster in that movie was so good. The first time I saw, actually, the first time I heard it, I didn't even know what it was until like the nostalgia critic and. I watched it myself without his review. I'm like, thinking, this is not a bad film at all. It's pretty good. I'm surprised it's not like it didn't gain that like you know attention that it deserves. Well, yeah, it's a cult but, film. Yeah, it yeah. is. I love the the concept. It's Goonies meets Universal Monsters, especially how like it's it's in the '80s. It's like what could make it the film any better? Yeah. Hey guys, real quickly before the end of the review, I would like to make some recommendation on uh, some Universal Monster reading books. For those of you who are fans of the Universal Monsters, I highly recommend one of these books. Universal Studios Monsters, A Legacy of Horror, Horror by Michael Mallory. What's great about this book is each chapter has an individual history and a storyline about the monsters and all the films, and also it has an individual chapter brief biography about each like Universal Monster actor like Boris, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi and Lon Chaney, etc. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. The second one is a classic of the a celebration of the classics from Universal Studios Monsters. It's the same with this book, but just uh, what's different about this, they show you a little bit more pictures. They only give you like a brief description of each of the chapters of the, about the monsters, the movies, and the actors. Mm. Yeah, so check them out. So yeah, that was our review of Universal's 1931 adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And our next movie review will be The Bride of Frankenstein. So stay tuned for that, and see you later.